Dear all, this is the first out of the seven short recordings that will be done a summary of the International Business Law Lectures held by Dr. Marco Akami at the European Law School Bachelor's Course of the Maastricht University. This is a summary of the first lecture of the course. It is meant to be a brief overview which does not replace the attendance to the lectures or the tutorials, the reading of the course reader and of the recommended literature therein. Please mind also that for your memorandum and mock arbitration strategy, you are required to cite all relevant articles, which for the sake of time are not always mentioned here. The first lecture focuses in three aspects. One, the practicalities of the course, particularly as far as the assessment methods are concerned. Two, the determination of the law applicable to international commercial transactions. And three, the formation of contracts under the United Nations Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods, or CISG. As for the first point, the practicalities of the course, you'll be able to find in your course manual and the PowerPoint slides of the lecture all the relevant information. Let us then start by the second point, the determination of the law applicable to international commercial transactions. Why do we need to assess which is the law applicable to a certain international transaction? Well because an international transaction involves, by nature, a connection with different legal systems, mainly because of the different places of business of the parties to the contract. If these legal systems happen to have the same solutions for the same legal questions, this wouldn't be an issue. However, this is rarely so. Imagine that a small company from Aix-en-Provence, in France, called Cent, starts its business of lavender-based products. Soon after starting its activity, Scent receives an email from an Istanbul-based company, Sabun. Sabun is a hammam center with multiple locations across Turkey, and they need lavender essence for their treatments. Marie, Scent's orders manager, immediately confirms via email Scent's availability to sell the products and send Sabun their standardized contract. Send standardized contract consists of two clauses only, one on the scope of the contract, another one on the price. After sending the merchandise, Sabun refuses to pay and Marie tells Pierre, Sense legal advisor, that there is a problem. Pierre wants to know under which legal system Sent should claim damages. Pierre knows that Turkey is not a European state. Well, at least not yet. And so he knows that the EU regulation on the law applicable to contractual obligations, or Rome 1, which he studied during law school, cannot apply. In this case, which law must we call upon? To know which law applies to a given situation, such as you had to do to solve cases 1 and 2 of the tutorial number 1, you should use the chart on page 6 of the course reader. Here we see the parties do not have a choice of law clause, so we immediately think of the CISG as a potential candidate for applying. Why? Well, this is a contract of sales, and it has a cross-border component. The application of the CISG will take place through Article 1, Paragraph 1a, whenever both parties are from the 89 contracting states, or through Article 1, Paragraph 1b, whenever at least the seller is from one of the contracting states, and the parties did not make reservations to the CISG under Article 9. In any other case, 
as well as when the CISG has a gap and does not provide an answer to the legal question, Rome 1 will apply to determine which national law will apply. Note, however, that does not always mean the national law will apply. The prevalence of federal rules, as the Asante Technologies case in page 6 shows, can still lead the CISG to be applied in the end. Now imagine that Sabun receives a second international order from a German spa center based in Dusseldorf called Feucht und Heiß. It is a huge order, so they start working on it immediately and reject other big orders. However, Feucht und Heiß takes back the order, thereby leaving Sent without any big order at all. Pierre wants to claim for loss of perte de chance, or loss of chance, but he recalls that he did not set in the sale of goods contract which law would be applied in case of dispute. So he wonders now under which law they can sue the German company. He would of course rather apply French than German law, where the loss of chance doctrine is a more established one. In this case, we are before two European states, France and Germany. For such reason, Rome 1 would apply if it was not for the fact that the CISG prevails over it. Indeed, and as you know, contrarily to Rome 1, the CISG actually provides answers to substantial questions. So it prevails over Rome 1, because Rome 1 does not answer substantial questions, it only points out at the law which is applicable. Now, had the parties had a choice of law clause and opted out of the CISG, the applicable law would be the French one, through the combined application of Article 4, 1a and 19. This means Pierre, sans legal advisor, would be able to sue under French law, as he wished. Now, a bit about the third and last aspect of the lecture. While the issue of application of law can be found in Part 1 of the CISG, the issue of formation of contract can be found in Part 2 of the CISG. Every contracting state that has not made an Article 92 exception will be under these rules. As most of you know already from the contract law course you had earlier in your bachelor course, an agreement consists of an offer and its acceptance. The offer is valid the moment it reaches the other party. For the different theories as to when a contract is concluded, check out page 7 of the course reader. Remember the difference between withdrawal and revocation? You can have a look at it in the excellent comparative contract log book from Jan Smits or in the handy summary on top of page 8 of the course reader. The offeror has the opportunity to withdraw the offer up to and including the moment that the offer reaches the offeree. If the offer becomes valid, the offeree has time for considering it, and the amount of time depends on the content of the offer and whether or not the offer was in writing. Up to the moment the offeree sends its acceptance, the offerer has the option of revoking his offer unless the offer is irrevocable. The offeree can decide to accept the offer, refuse it, or make a counter offer to the offerer. If he decides on a counter offer, there will actually be a new offer on the table. Ah! We hope you enjoyed this short summary of the first lecture and we look forward to seeing you next time in lecture number two.